coming up on First at Four. Helping those who couldn't help themselves at the time when they needed it most. I'm Dakota Makers in West Liberty, and I bring you the story of one EMS worker's journey on that fateful day 10 years ago. And one mayor in the Big Sandy is sharing a tornado story of his own, looking back at a day of destruction and a decade of community members working together to rebuild. And it feels like spring out here, and we've got even more on the way as we head into the rest of the work week. I'll have the full details coming up on right now on First at Four. Dedicated to Eastern and Southern Kentucky, this is WYMT Mountain News First at Four. Good afternoon, I'm Steve Hensley. First at four, we look back on this day 10 years ago when many parts of Kentucky resembled the scenes you see behind me after tornadoes tore through the region. We've seen a lot of recovery in the decade since, but for many, the memories of that day will last a lifetime. We've talked with people across Eastern Kentucky who dealt with the storms firsthand and are sharing their stories with us today. We begin our anniversary team coverage with WYMT's Brandon Robinson and Dakota Makris, who are live in West Liberty. Steve, good to be here today. And again, you just look around town here. I actually posted some pictures a little while ago, and you can tell how much has changed in the last 10 years here, and most of it for the better. Yeah. Most of it for the better here. And we are back here. We're not celebrating, but we're honoring those right. we lost on, uh, 10 years ago today. But Dakota, you talked to somebody who worked this event, yeah. and, and you tell us their story. Yeah, so I talked with a paramedic, because sometimes we often forget about our rescue crews who right. are boots on the ground once these events happened. And I talked with the Morgan County paramedic who, well, he answered the call that night. March 2nd, 2012 started as a normal shift for paramedic Brian Plank. They started reporting tornadoes coming through, so uh, we went out in the parking lot to, to watch because uh, it got to be pretty captivating uh, as we were standing out there and watching it come over basically where the hospital would be. The EF3 tornado was moving towards West Liberty between 50 to 60 miles per hour, destroying everything in its path. We went down to the end of uh, 172 and sat there at the intersection till we could see which way the tornado was going to go and we were going to head the other direction and get out of its path and then come back in. They made their way back into town, eventually leaving their trucks because roads were blocked. As we were walking down, we were people were just starting to come out of their homes, their houses, or what was left of them. Uh, there were several trailer parks and things that were in town that were in total disarray and people were basically just coming back out of the rubble. An old building was used to house people who were injured or left without a home. They found one man who suffered multiple injuries. And it was more than we could, more than we could treat. Basically, we could wrap him up, we could, we could control bleeding, we could do some of that stuff, but there wasn't any physical way of getting him out. He helped as many as he could, including a couple whose house was blown away. And I said, where were you all at through this? And the lady looked at me and she was like, we were right here. I said, like where we're at though here, because it, it, at that point with me, it wasn't sinking in. And she said, we were right here. He can't walk. And I didn't have time to get him up and help get him moved. 10 years later, that day is very much fresh on his mind. It was a fulfilling experience. Uh, for me, it was, it was uh, I was glad to have the opportunity. I would not want to have the opportunity again, nor would I want anybody else to ever have to go through that. And once people were cared for, he and his crew headed out to check out other parts of the county, and the recovery was already underway. The neighbors, the people there, were already coming together and clearing roadways and doing things. Uh, and I liked seeing that, and I think it's a good sign of eastern Kentucky, as neighbors helping neighbors. They wasn't waiting on somebody to come and dig them out. And Brian told, told Dakota that he took 100 people to the hospital in just 30 <laughs> minutes, so that's crazy. Meanwhile, mess, while West Liberty took some of the largest hits in those day storms, the damage could be seen across the region, including in Laurel County. We go there now live to WYMT Zach Hawk, who has spent the day with the man who is thrown into the thick of his community search and recovery effort. Zach, tell us about Abby Hale. 
Yeah, Brandon, so I'm standing at the East Bernstadt Fire Department where 10 years ago today, this building you see behind me was serving as a community center while a tornado roared across I-75 just a few minutes away. The East Bernstadt tornado destroyed nearly 400 homes and killed six people in this community. Albert Hale was the emergency management director that terrible day. He remembers working with emergency responders from across the area to search through the rubble to find survivors and victims. The victims' families will never forget. Time, I, I say time helps ease the pain, but there's no forgetting. You'll never forget. It'll always be in the back of your mind. Brandon, Albert and I spent much of the day traveling to the places he saw that night and talking about how it made him feel and how the community's changed in the decades since then. I'm looking forward to bringing that to you in just a little bit. Live in Laurel County, Zach Hawk, WYMT, Mountain News. Back to you. All right, Zach, we appreciate you for that report there. Looking forward to seeing that story at 6 o'clock. While we talked about two of the hardest hit areas, those aren't the only ones that were impacted. Those were the ones where the most people were killed, but we have others to talk about. The tornadoes also dealt a lot of damage in communities throughout the Big Sandy region. Hundreds of homes were damaged or destroyed in the western parts of Johnson County like Hager Hill and West Van Leer. Another blow to the area, two young men lost their lives in the Middle Fork area and dozens of others were injured. Johnson County Sheriff Doug Saylor remembers that night. He was a jailer at the time but says, the surprise, says he's surprised that the amount of damage brought to the community was remarkable. We, there was no way that we could anticipate the damages from this tornado. We'd never experienced anything like this. This was all new to our complete area. Uh, so many people didn't know how to prepare. And that's changed so much since 2012 in the last 10 years. Since that fateful day, the area has been rebuilt, but you can still see fallen trees throughout the area as remnants of that storm. Now, that destruction was also seen in McGoffin County with much of the Salyersville area near the Mountain Parkway and le being left in need of major repairs. WYMT's buddy, uh, buddy Forbes is there as locals remember the day that changed everything. Ten years ago, most of the buildings here on Restaurant Row were leveled. Destruction left behind by a tornado that rarely leaves the minds of those who lived through it. Salyersville Mayor Pete Shepard recalls the day and those that followed as a nightmare. It was one of the most worst moments of my life as mayor. A tornado cutting through parts of Salyersville, destroying homes, schools, businesses, and peace of mind. Because I've seen the pictures of Restaurant Row with some of the businesses that was completely flattened. I just couldn't believe that it wasn't some type of loss of life. So with injuries but no deaths reported, the town slowly started to rebuild. When there's a disaster or something that comes around that affects a lot of the people, they all come together. And that's one great thing about living here in a small community. Bringing back most of the businesses lost. This building right here used to be the Subway restaurant. And looking back 10 years later, at how the people put the pieces back together. We've come back bigger and better. Some say they still feel that uneasiness wash over them, like with the recent tornadoes in western Kentucky when it all came rushing back. But they believe, like what happened here, communities can often find a new strength as they build themselves back up. In Salyersville, Buddy Forbes, WYMT Mountain News. Uh, Brandon, uh, He's back in West Liberty. We're going to go to Evan Hatter in East Bernstead for a look at the forecast in just a moment. But Brandon, I know you walked through downtown today and you used to drive through West Liberty going to college before the tornadoes hit. You were there on the fifth anniversary right. after the tornadoes. What, what's changed in the last 10 years? So much, Steve. I mean, there is so much rebuilding that has gone on. Most of the efforts have uh, are perfect there. They're back to where they were post or pre-storm, maybe even better than pre-storm. But some areas were never rebuilt. They weren't touched again. They're vacant lots now. We're actually standing right, right next to one that uh, the grass has grown up. So for some folks, people like Evan Hatter, who may not have been here, uh, kind of take us back, Evan, to kind of what your experience. I know you were much younger when all this went on, but before you start first weather, just give us your perspective on just the meteorological side of things. 
right. I was a freshman in high school at the time, and honestly, today reminds me a lot of what the weather was like on March 1st. It was a beautiful sunny day, barely a cloud in the sky, but being a weather enthusiast, even at that young age, I knew that the next day was going to be a rough one around the Ohio Valley. I was actually remember watching the coverage from our now sister station wave in Louisville of the tornadoes in southern Indiana and was honestly shocked that this was the weather system unfolding across the region and that was headed our way as well heading into the rest of that afternoon and even when I saw the images later out of eastern Kentucky my heart just broke knowing that even those storms we saw what they did in southern Indiana and were even moving across our region as well and We've rebuilt, we've gotten through it, and now here we are on an absolutely beautiful day 10 years later looking back at what was a very tough day in the mountains. Though right now, all is quiet weather-wise around the region as we continue to see beautiful sunshine around the mountains. Let's take a look around the mountains as we head through the remainder of the afternoon. We look outside at the moment to Moorhead, I-64. A few high clouds beginning to push into the region, but we're all quiet in terms of the actual sensible weather out there, and it feels actually pretty nice outside. Upper 60s, low 70s. That's what I was saying when I said it reminded me of March 1st, 2012, because it was a beautiful day just like today out there, and we even see temperatures in the low 70s, 73 right now in Jacksboro. Nothing to keep an eye on on satellite and radar. A few high clouds pushing through the Big Sandy, but that is about it as we head into our region. Backing on out, you see you have to go up into central Indiana before you run into, run into even any sprinkles out there. So it's a quiet night. We'll expect more quiet weather heading into tomorrow. So keep that WYMT weather app handy. It's going to be a nice evening out there. Maybe fire up the grill. Uh, Get, get prepped for the spring and uh, summer grilling season out there. We're falling into the 50s overnight. We actually stay a little bit above average for overnight lows as clouds build in ahead of a small system trying to head our way for tomorrow. I'll have the latest on when a few showers could return to the forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Steve, back to you. All right, Evan Hatter for us today in East Bernstadt, and we want to thank all of our crews from East Bernstadt to Sayersville and places in between. Uh, we're trying to get to many of the places affected most by the tornado outbreak 10 years ago, and we will have much more coming up in all of our newscasts later tonight. In other news, a suspect in a high-profile Madison County murder case pleaded not guilty in front of a judge this morning. 23-year-old Shannon Gilday is charged with murder and attempted murder after a break-in at the home of former State Representative Wesley Morgan last week. Jim Stratman was inside the courthouse this morning. The judicial process is just beginning for 23-year-old Shannon Gilday. This morning, he was arraigned in front of a Madison County judge, read his charges, and a not guilty plea was entered on his behalf on all counts. Gilday is charged with murder, the shooting death of 32-year-old Jordan Morgan, along with burglary, criminal mischief, assault, and two counts of attempted murder. Kentucky State Police say that Gilday came to the home of former State Representative Wesley Morgan early in the morning of February 22nd. Court documents say that he broke into an upstairs hallway armed with an assault rifle and made his way to the bedroom of Jordan Morgan. Those documents say that Gilday shot his way into the bedroom, fired a number of rounds, and killed the 32-year-old. At that point, the records show that Gilday went downstairs where the master bedroom is. Inside was the former state representative, his wife, and his 14-year-old daughter. Morgan and Gilday began shooting at each other before Gilday fled the scene. The morning of the shooting, Morgan told our news partners at the Herald Leader that he had been shot but was recovering. Kentucky State Police spent nearly a week searching for Gilday before they found him walking along exit 87's overpass of I-75 in Madison County, just a couple miles away from the home. He was taken into custody without any incident and is booked in the Madison County Detention Center. Right now, his bond is set at $2 million. This morning, the judge assigned a court-appointed lawyer for Gilday. His next hearing is scheduled for March 9th at 9.30. Reporting in Madison County, Jim Stratman, WKYT. State troopers say they are still working to determine a motive in the case. Gilday's mother said in a statement her son was having some mental hardships and believed nuclear war was coming. She said he had been talking about underground bunkers before the home invasion. We know the Morgan property had a bunker based on its Zillow posting.
State police say they'll have to talk with Gilday himself before they can determine an official motive. Still to come on First at Four, updates on the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine where many are trying to leave the country and saying they are having problems at the border. And you think the weather is nice outside today? I've got even more in that on the way. I'll have the full details in your seven-day forecast coming up next.